Welcome to my video on angles. My name is Ruse, and in order to answer the question, what are the best angles, or how can I use angles to create the best advantages for myself, we'll have to answer a couple questions. And some of those questions just happen to be on this agenda. So starting off, we're gonna find out what is an angle. Then we'll find out how do angles apply in game, and specifically in Valorant. What is holding an angle versus pushing an angle? And then what is an FOV? Next, we're gonna talk about how distance applies to angles. And then once we have those basic concepts down, we'll look at a technique called slicing the pie or pieing. Within that technique, we'll find out what an OODA loop is or observe, orient, decide, act. And then we'll take a look at a clip of me winning and then also losing the OODA loop. And don't worry if it doesn't make any sense right now, it will later. Next, we're gonna to have to find out how maps are made because we have all these concepts and we need to apply them somewhere. And in the maps is where we apply those things. We'll find out what gray boxing is and why Riot believes in gameplay first. And then we'll pretend to be a junior map developer and walk through some of the reasoning of map balances. We'll examine a balanced, weak, and strong angle. And then we'll take all that information into the breeze changes on 7.04 that happened. And we'll take a look at mid on breeze to see why Riot would want to change. Maybe certain angles or put things in different places. Next, and probably most importantly, is at this point, we haven't shot a, a gun yet. So we need to find out how guns apply to distance and then how those apply to angles. And then once we wrap that all up, to make things easier on ourselves, when we're looking around the map, we'll identify things called headshot textures. And sometimes a headshot texture will tell you if it's head level or if it might be above or below it. Finally, we'll talk about what we're gonna do in our next episode. Now this video is going to be two parts, so please join me on this quick journey into the idea of angles. Now what is an angle? An angle is formed when two straight lines or rays meet at a common endpoint. The common point of contact is called the vertex of an angle. So if we take a second to take a look at the properties of an angle, we see here the vertex is the center point or common point or common endpoint, sorry, of these two arms. These two arms have points attached to them, which are labeled X and Y, and the space in between is where we measure the angle. Now, before we jump into how this applies, I wanna introduce another concept, and that's where the angle is greater than 180 degrees, but less than 360. And this will be important in a second. So when we come down and take a look at a common situation, Traditionally, when we talk about angles, we're only talking about one person. So right now, let's talk about our hero, Gecko. Gecko is holding the tube angle. You can see where the tube angle is by following the line to the arrow, and you see that it meets at, you know, a vertex. Now, like I said, traditionally, this is where the conversation usually ends. But let's add something on top to make it a bit more interesting. What if instead of just traditionally holding an angle meant just pointing towards the vertex, but now we'll add the addition of ISO. Because it matters where ISO is in relation to the angle, right? Because that's what we're trying to achieve. When ISO pushes up and gets to a certain point, Gecko should be able to see him before ISO sees Gecko. And that's why we hold angles. Now, let's go into a scenario that happens fairly often. Our hero, Gecko, shows up again on defense, and we have labeled him P1, and he's holding the defensive angle. We come down to ISO, ISO is P2, and he's pushing the angle. And this is all happening on bind long B. So just a stone's throw from our last example. Now the vertex here is the wall. And you can see that Gecko is holding the wall, and that enables him to have Eh, a little bit of an advantage. You see, Gecko is further away from the wall, which is important because since his camera is set in the middle of his face for immersion purposes, the only way to see more of ISO is to push further away, sorry, farther away from the vertex. And so when ISO, who's not a point, but a player model, pushes up long B, parts of his body will be shown first, and he will not be able to see 
that his body is showing first because he's still looking at the vertex, which creates a different vision angle, so he can't see Gecko. And this is the balance of like angles and where the magic happens. So let's go ahead and dive in a little deeper and talk about the player model. Now, when you decide to play a game of Valorant, you pick an agent. And for this example, we're picking the agent Cypher. Cypher, as a player model, has a camera in the center of his head. So anywhere you move, what you see is from Cypher's point of view at head level. The field of vision is what you can see on your monitor. So if we're taking a look at this example, your field of vision or what you can see, the edges here are what are displayed on your monitor. So coming back to our example, since we are a fixed camera, our player model has parts of it that stick out that we don't necessarily see when we're looking through our field of vision. And those are like our shoulders, our arms, parts of our legs, these little bits of extra uh, that are not within what you would think uh, is your body. Because you're looking through the camera, you kind of have an intuitive sense of like where your body is. But when it comes to tactile FPS genre, your shoulders or body parts always stick out before you can see things, right? Because you were just a floating camera in the center of this person's head, the body uh, is protruding on both sides. So when you peek an angle, your shoulder or your leg will lead first before you get vision of what you're peeking. And you can do this as an experiment. So don't try this at home, I'm a trained professional, but I was able to recreate the same sort of idea. So imagine this is me and I go behind a wall, okay? And when I'm behind the wall, I cover up my eye, all right? So I'm covering up my right eye. Now let's say that I have a cat in my room and I wanna be able to see the cat. Well, right now, all I see is the wall. But what happens is that as soon as I move backwards from the wall, more and more is revealed to me. And that's because my eye more or less has a cone of vision that is being unblocked as we move backwards, right? So I'm seeing more and more of the space until I see the cat. So more distance from the wall means that you have more vision. And this sort of thing applies in Valorant. So going to an example here, when Gecko, or P1 in this situation, is looking down and holding the angle, what he's doing is he doesn't see anything at this point because ISO isn't there yet. But as soon as ISO starts to cross into the 180, so we're talking about like, you know, uh, your 185 degrees and beyond, so this part right here, his arms and legs will show up in Gecko's vision before the ISO can see the Gecko. And that's because the camera is fixed in the middle of the body and the body protrudes in both directions. So that's what these lines represent. So as he's moving up, coming into the vision of Gecko, his arms and legs are going to be shown first. And so we can more or less synthesize this into a rule, which is that a person farther away from the vertex of the angle or object between the two players will be able to see more of their opponent as the camera is fixed at the center of a player model and the shoulders will always be exposed before a player can see you. As a player walks farther away from the vertex, you will see deeper into the angle. And that's simply the same thing as this example here where we moved backwards, we were able to see deeper into the room and my left eye was finally able to see the cat. We can also see that example here in the game as if we were to take this first X. If we take this first X and draw a line to the vertex of the wall, you see that it only kind of covers a certain space and I can't get deep into this angle. But if I step backwards in the world and go farther from the angle, I'm able to see deeper into the angle. And that's what we're always trying to achieve in Valorant. We're trying to find a deeper angle to hold from. So now that we've learned about angles and distance from angles, we can move on to the techniques. So slicing the pie or pieing refers to an analogy of a tactical pie that a player and an opponents are attempting to slice so they will gain a larger piece for themselves or a superior tactical advantage over the opponent in the confrontation. Pieing is a dynamic movement technique designed to minimize exposure around cover and maximize the tactical advantage for the player. Now how this plays out is let's say that the O 
is us, and the x is our opponent. Understanding pi is that we're looking at this vertex right here, and we'll, we'll stay in the context of angles. So I'm constantly looking at the vertex of this angle and past it, okay? And so as I'm making my movements, which are kind of like short sweeping movements, I'm constantly looking past the angle, right? And so you can think of as I'm moving, I'm constantly focusing my attention past the angle, right? And so the reason for this uh, is something we can get a little deeper into, and it's called the ODA loop. So OODA loop. Uh, Pi revolves around the dynamic process that Air Force Colonel John Boyd labeled the ODA loop. ODA stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. Each party in the confrontation continuously engages in cycles of ODA. So they constantly are going through this loop. They're observing, they're orienting themselves to the situation, they're deciding what they're going to do, and then they do it. The opponent who completes the ODA loop the quickest at each stage of the tactical maneuver will be the victor. So at each stage where I'm slicing the pie and going through my ODA loop, if I'm doing this quicker than my opponent, then I'm going to be the one who wins the engagement. And here's why. One of the tenets of ODA loop is the exploitation of surprise. The winning player increases the duration of the orient phase of the opponent's ODA loop by disrupting the opponent's expectations regarding the player's tactics. So what that means is, is that if I'm completing my ODA loop faster, this player who maybe is kind of like walking around and, and doesn't know what they're doing, trying to orient themselves to the situation, will get to the point where I have sliced the pie and I, they are now within my field of vision. Well, they don't know that I'm in this field of vision. And so when they turn to look, they see, the, they see you with a gun pointed at them. Uh, and so then they have to decide and act, right? So you've beat them because you're already on act. You're pointing, you're ready to shoot. They're just walking around trying to figure out what's going on and orient themselves to the situation. And that is more or less the ODA loop. So how can the ODA loop be applied uh, in our situation in game? Well, it's the same sort of concept, right? I have already completed my ODA loop as Gecko here as P1, holding the angle and waiting for P2 or ISO to push my angle. So just like in the example that we just did, P2 is walking up, kind of doesn't know what's going on, but P1 has already decided that he's gonna hold the angle. So when P2 becomes visible to P1, he has to orient himself to the situation and attack P1, but that time frame that he's lost gives Gecko the advantage and thus having the advantage more likely to eliminate ISO. I wanted to show you an example of the ODA loop and how I was able to take advantage of the ODA loop to end up winning a 1v3 situation. Now, the map that we are playing is Haven and we are in the Long C site. The bomb was dropped in Long C and there are three opponents who are in the seaside, who are attackers. I have decided to flank, and when I flank, this is when the situation happens. So I'm gonna let it play now. Thirty seconds left. Not enough. One enemy remaining. Got three. Cannot. Let's talk about what happened in the clip. So in the clip, uh, this is me, and I am playing the defender, and the spike has gone down. All right, now that the spike has gone down, I'm expecting the three people left over to go towards the spike, okay? And since I have given up all control of over here and over here, so garage and spawn, I'm expecting everyone to kind of make their way towards bomb kind of like stick together sort of ideology, right? So what you see is like the Yoru come down. And when I hear the Yoru TP, whether it's fake or not, uh, I have the expectation that we're going to get a Yoru pushing down and potentially going for the orb. So what I do is I set up here and what I'm waiting for in this off angle is for Yoru to come down and grab the orb. And so what you see is me kind of like freak out a little bit because he doesn't go for the orb. Uh, and I end up getting the headshot. 
So now that I know that uh, Yoru is down, I'm expecting the Breach player at some point to follow up, right? Because very rarely does Breach go off and do his own thing. Breach is usually a number two person uh, who supports like either a duelist or, or another teammate. So what my idea is that I know this flash is coming. How do I bait it, right? And so I let off two shots that hit the wall. Now what I'm trying to explain to the Breach is, is that I'm in this back wall and I'm spamming this corner to try to like kill him. So that's what I'm trying to feint here or try to like disguise or, you know, <coughs> bruise. Uh, so as the breach comes out, he's expecting me to be blind in this back corner, but I've faked it. And so when he swings, I swing and then I end up getting the kill. Now, all of these mistakes that they've made is more or less in the Oda phase of orientation, right? Is that because I've completed my Oda loop first and I'm waiting on my act, part of the Oda loop, these two players of Breach and Yoru who push in, they have no idea where I am. And every time, so for the Yoru player, the Yoru player thought I was here, the Breach thought I was here. So when they did not see me here, in the Oda loop, the Orient part is now screaming, where is the player? And that's where I get the surprise, which is the main tenant of the Oda loop, right? Uh, on the Yoru and Breach, thus killing them both, all right? Now it's a 1v1 situation. And unfortunately, I did exactly what Breach and Yoru did, which was over swing this position, right? I was in my loop. For whatever reason, I broke out of my loop. And now I'm in this orient phase where I'm swinging. And I get lucky because the KJ is right here. And she is so hooked to this vertex of the corner that when I do a wide swing, she has to make this large correction. And that's what ends up winning the uh, engagement and the round for me. So now that we've talked about angles, distance, uh, and the variations of pushing and holding, I want to dive a deeper into map making. Because ultimately, all of these ideas don't work unless there's a map to play them on. And so here, Sun Benny Sun asks a great question. What comes first, map layout or theme? And I'm not going to go through the rest because it's kind of just adding more to it. But, uh, you know, a very pointed question. So Manwolf Axeboss, who is a level designer or developer at Riot, says, great question. Our maps are gameplay first. So the gray boxing definitely leads, leads the way. That said, theme can often give shape, literally, to gray box maps. And we are usually thinking about the two in tandem. Icebox is a great example where the two are built side by side. And so that makes you think a little bit, like what exactly does it mean by that? So uh, Joe down here adds a little bit more context. So he says, for Valorant, I'd say that the layout often comes first when we're designing the maps. Though sometimes themes can come in early, which can help us shape uh, the spaces more intentionally. For example, Icebox was always some kind of port with shipping containers, right? So if we take these two ideas and put them together, it looks like when it came to Icebox, they had a general concept, right? the general concept that it was going to be a port. And so they added the details kind of around that. But all of these graphics and all these pictures are just pictures right now. They're just in concept form. This is concept art. It's when they get down to the gray boxing that they're actually level building. And when they're level building, they have to move things around in order to make them balance. So how do they do that? Well, we come back to the AMA and Nesmeroz uh, asks another great question which is how many times have you guys had to change a map because a QA playtest found something really broken, like a weird angle or something? You know, which map was it? And can you give us an example? And Joe again comes in and says, thanks for your question. We're usually not caught too off guard by crazy angles. We spend a lot of time in our maps in design phase and test extensively with the rest of the design team long before it goes to QA or art. And so what does that mean? Well, you get a bunch of people and they playtest your map. And over the course of the playtesting, they test out various angles or various flows and uh, they come back and they more or less report on what exactly they felt, all right? And then the level designers go in and make the changes or the designers go in with the level designers and make the changes, make the changes and then they go back and the people come back and they do the testing again. They say, hey, that angle looks good or that part of the map is now playing better. Uh, and through these iterations, this is like months of development 
uh, until you finally release it to the world. And so let's go through a little hypothetical situation here. Uh, let's imagine that you are the junior developer and your boss has asked you to build a level. And so when we start off, let's just say this is my first level. So I go to my boss and I'm like, hey, this is my first level, what do you think? And it's like, well, this level's not the greatest because as soon as both sides spawn, they're just gonna fight each other. And there's this whole other side of the map that you're not even paying attention to. All right, so I go back to the drawing board as the junior level designer and I'm, I'm right, okay, I'll move it. So now they can't see each other. So I take it back to my boss and my boss is like, well, guess what? Like now you can go to the map, but the opponent can't, right? So we're going through all these iterations. I'm changing up the map. So let's say that like I change here and I change here. Uh, and so I'm like, all right, great, here's my map. Take it back to my boss. Hey, here's my map. Yeah, it's kind of boring. So like we add some shapes, you know, we're like, okay, we're good to go. Let's have the playtesters come in. Playtesters come in, they try the map out. And it seems like, you know, there's like this one spot that's a little too powerful. So we'll call this person, person one. Uh, and when person two comes out, uh, it's such a long angle that uh, it really doesn't give this person a chance to, to react. So what we do is we add in features in the map. And so now this long angle that was once uh, really strong is now blocked. And so this is more or less how levels are, are created. All right, before we jump in the breeze, I wanted to take a moment to explain the difference between types of angles and how a developer can influence uh, whether an angle is balanced, weak, or strong. So in order to have a balanced angle, the distance from you to the vertex, so this point right here, and this is your arm and this is your point, has to be the same distance from your opponent's point and arm. So these distances have to be equal. So we'll write this one x, this one y, and in order for an angle to be balanced, uh, they both have to equal each other. So let's just say randomly, uh, this is like 15 meters, this other side has to be 15 meters too from the uh, structure or thing that is forcing you into the angle. Uh, they have to be equal to each other. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, it's basically you and your opponent have equal distances to the vertex or box, wall, or whatever you're looking at. So what is a weak angle then? Well, a weak angle is when your angle here, so our Y angle, that's a terrible Y, uh, is shorter than our opponent's x angle, right? Uh, or sorry, x distance. So your y distance is shorter than your opponent's x distance. And just like the examples that we saw before, uh, where I'm looking at a wall, the farther this distance is, the more of you that is shown to your opponent, right? So the opposite of weak is a strong angle, where it's the opposite of that situation, where your arm here is longer than your opponent's arm, right? So X is shorter than Y. Uh, so you see the opponent before the opponent sees you, and that's considered a strong angle. So do a quick recap. Uh, a balanced angle is where the distances between the two points are the same. A weak angle is where your distance is shorter than your opponent's distance. And a strong angle is where your uh, distance is longer than your opponent's. This concludes part one of our angles video. The angles video kind of spiraled out of control and ended up being a 40 minute video. So I've broken it down into two 20 minute videos for easier viewing. So if you made it this far, thank you for watching and hopefully you stick tuned to part two of our angles series. Thanks.